Welcome to the Kevin Clancy Show. I've been in this game over a decade and I knew I needed a place where I could run wild on my own solo podcast, where I tell personal stories, I deep dive into conspiracy theories, we rip through the current events of the day, and we do sit down conversations with the most interesting people on the internet. Make sure you click subscribe so you don't miss an episode. What's up, you mutts? It's another episode of the Kevin Clancy Show. Uh, I got a lot to get into. I missed last week with the Coco. And I am still, uh, I am still sluggish and dragging ass. I'm like the, I think I'm like the last person alive, the last person on earth that got like a semi real dose of COVID. Everyone else and their mom caught the Omicron. They got fucking the Optimus Prime and they were fine. It was just like, you know, they got the sniffles, had a headache and they were done. I got like old school COVID. I got like that true, I got that 19. I got like the, the you know, like COVID basically became four loco. And, and that was part of the problem. That's part of the whole problem with all of uh, all the arguments and all the debates is that there's a new COVID and an old COVID. And it's like the new Four loco, which is not, not even fucking comparable to the old school Four loco when they were jacking up the alcohol content and the, the energy content and the caffeine was like ripping your body apart. You can't compare the old Four loco to the new Four loco. You can't compare new COVID to old COVID. Because one is like a cold, the other one was, you know, ravaging our country. And when everybody else is basically when it's like done and burned out and, and weakened, I somehow mushed myself into getting that real COVID where it fucking hit me like a goddamn ton of bricks. So uh, missed last week, back in it now. Definitely got that COVID fog, though. I never understood what people were talking about when they said that. And they're like, I'm in a haze or it's foggy. I'm like, shut up. Just be an adult. Your whole life's a, f- a fucking fog once you're an adult, you know? But I definitely get it now where I'm like, nothing's working. Just like everything's taken. A, one minute man takes a million takes and I'm hot and cold and sweating and tired and groggy. It's a whole fucking mess. But anyway, I'm back in the saddle with a big episode because I got a few things to talk about over the last couple of weeks. Um, some things that we touched upon on KFC Radio, if you listen to both shows, but I'd like to get into a little bit more because I know that. John's not always as interested in some of these topics with Rogan and the internet and, and, uh, and that whole debacle. So I want to touch on some of that and a lot to get into uh, pop culture wise, starting off though with fucking China and the Olympics. I don't know if anybody gives a shit about the Olympics anymore. I can't remember less buzz in my lifetime for an Olympics. And I don't know why that is. It could just be, you know, because of the pandemic and because of, I don't know, I actually don't know what it is, but there's just, you know, for a, a sports, a relative sports company that we work at, there's no coverage other than Jeff D. Lowe's weird ass and nobody really cares about it. But, um, but nonetheless, is China fucking kidding me? I mean, this is, th- these shots of the goddamn nuclear power plants behind the the ski pipes, the ski slopes, is patently ridiculous. Is China fucking for real? Are you absolutely kidding me, China? This is where you decide to host the Olympics in the fucking cockles of the of a nuclear power plant, deep in the heart of a nuclear power plant zone. That's got to be a that that's China trolling, no. That, that shot, when you see the gigantic ski slope and behind it is like six smokestacks, it's absolutely preposterous. And then they zoom out and it somehow gets worse. You realize that the power plant smokestacks are like the, the good part of where they're hosting these, these, these events. It's like a desolate, barren wasteland. Makes Chernobyl look alive and popping. China's fucking huge. It's an enormous country. They probably got endless amounts of of sprawling land. And you guys decide to do the the ski and snowboard jumps and shit, which which is like undoubtedly one of the most popular events, right in the middle of like, you know, nuclear world. Looks like we're in Jurassic Park for nuclear bombs. It's crazy. I, I, I mean, that's, that's got to be like, China, you're done, dude. 
if think about any party you've ever hosted, any party you've ever gone to, if you go to somebody's party and the place fucking sucks and they're hosting you like in the dirty, unfinished basement, you'd be like, uh, this is not the right place to host the party, guys. Fucking China wins the bid, doesn't tell anybody that we're going to be putting you, you know, inside the nuclear reactor. Oh, don't worry. We'll just do the ski jumps. You'll just land inside the fucking smokestack. How about that? You know, we'll do the giant flying V ski jumps and whoever lands inside the fucking nuclear reactor is the winner. Congratulations. You got the gold medal, but also your body is registering 150 Ronkin. And, uh, you know, you're going to grow a third eye and you're probably sterile now. Hope it was worth it because you can't have kids. And if you do, they're going to be mutated. Fucking China, get real. I mean, one of the more ridiculous sceneries you will ever see in sports is that shot right there. Like, I'm sure there's some sort of logistical reason about how they needed to, you know, building that sort of building required some sort of infrastructure that was there. But couldn't you just like turned it around just like so the cameras don't catch all the fucking power plant christ on the cross china step your game up and then the other the one other thing that i found the only thing that i really found interesting in in this olympics is eileen Gu. uh and again i don't know if you know barstool i'm not sure if they've been covering it but eileen Gu is this freestyle uh skier who absolutely is a fucking rocket ship uh to the moon as far as sponsorships and athletics and fame and fortune. She's an 18 year old Chinese American who uh, I think she, she grabbed gold last night. I'm not sure. Yeah. She won gold. She did a, a 1620 double cork or some shit. It was like a, a jump and a, and a twist that like only three women have ever done, but she's chosen to compete for China. She was born in San Francisco, uh, and I just don't even know how that's allowed. 18-year-old girl. She's beautiful. She's awesome. Like, she is the quintessential. If you were going to make an Olympic star, it would be this girl, right? She's representing – well, she's technically representing China, but being a Chinese-American, she's representing, like, the two biggest powerhouse countries in the world and certainly in the Olympics – in uh, what is the most like, you know, uh, uh, the, the doing the events that are, you know, most beloved and watched in the Winter Olympics. Good looking girl. Great at her sport. I mean, it is, you know, you put you put uh, her in a fucking lab and this is uh, this is what comes out for like the perfect Olympic champion. What I don't get is how she's allowed. Yeah, she did a double cork 1440. I'm not even going to pretend to know. How do these judges even fucking know? Are, are the judges sitting on the sidelines with like a slow-mo replay so they can really see like, all right, that was two and a half twists with one and a half flips or I can't, you know, all of these things look exactly the same to someone like me with the untrained eye. How, do these, how can these guys even see in real time? You know, and the, and, the, and the announcers are always like, oh, nope, never mind. Her career's over. That was devastating. And it looks like every other fucking jump I've ever seen. But. All I know is when you see when you see the shit that this girl can do in the air, it is absolutely fucking bananas. Apparently, she's like a good genius. She got a 1580 on her SATs. If you're still doing the 1600 scale, uh, you know, she she got into Stanford. She's I mean, you know. God gave this girl everything like hater of the year type shit. Why did God give Eileen Gu so much and me so, so little? Uh, but. It's this, this nationality thing that's making waves. So she was born in the United States to an American father and a Chinese mother, first generation immigrant from China. And she requested to change countries with like the ski, I think it's called the Ski Federation uh, to compete uh, representing China. And I, it's just, it's weird because China is not a country that allows dual citizenship. So it's not one of these situations where you can, you know, I was born in America and I'm American citizen, but I want to represent, you know, my, my family and, 
and uh, you know, my nationality. So I'm going to represent China. So, you know, I, I, I don't understand how it was allowed. And she said that she said like, uh, I'm American and I'm Chinese and you can't deny either of those. I'm both. And I'm cool with that, but I'm just wondering where, what, how are the, she said, quote, when I'm in the U S I'm American, but when I'm in China, I'm Chinese. I, uh, I'm not sure that's how the Olympics works. I think you got to pick a team. And in this case she did. And I'm just kind of uh, surprised that it was China. I feel like being a young um, seemingly like progressive. I mean, I don't know much about her uh, personality and, and her, you know, where, where she falls on issues and whatnot, but you know, China doesn't always have the best track record for treatment of uh, female athletes. And it seems like a wild move. If you, you know, feel like you're both, but you were, you know, you've lived in, born in, lived in and competed in America your whole life. But when the chips are down, you decided to compete for China. And I'm just thinking that she got the bag. I'm thinking that there was a fat ass duffel bag of cash where um, she just said, yeah, you win. But I don't know. I mean, it sounds like she, you know, she's also said that she's, uh, what is it? I'm reading here that she has dealt with, uh, you know, anti-Asian racism and uh, endured a lot of uh, obscenities and, you know, especially with COVID when there was a lot of the uh, Asian hate. So maybe with that fresh in mind, she was like, fuck America. Um, but it's, it's, it's a very interesting choice. Like when I learned about just how she's, you know, much more American in her, uh, in her like regular everyday life, I was pretty surprised that she ended up picking China, but man, that's a big time free agent miss by America. We gotta be on that. We gotta be on the ball with that. I don't know. We got to do some blue chips type shit. Like whatever China was offering, we should have doubled that, tripled that. This is, this is like the new Cold War in my mind. Forget about making it to the moon in the 60s. We should have had a fight for Eileen Goo. We should have been like, uh, I, don't, I don't like some Rocky, some Rocky. Uh, we, we should have done some MMA shit with like the top American fighter versus the top uh, Asian Chinese fighter, if there is one representing. And we could have done some trial by combat. Winner gets Eileen Goo. Or I suppose we can just, you know, leave it up to this adult woman to make her own decisions. But. I feel like we dropped the ball on that one, man. This chick is absolutely unbelievable. And we just let China just pull the rug out right from underneath us. I just, there's something more to it. I just, just knowing all that's at stake with, with national pride and money and competition and knowing how corrupt the, uh, the uh, uh, Olympic committee can be and knowing how corrupt Chinese sports and American sports can be. There's no way that this was just like a, you know, a cute little old, like, which team do you want to play for? There had to be way more going on. But um, shout out to Eileen Gu, who is just absolutely like right now, as far as solo sports goes, she is on top of the world. If you're even watching, I, I almost feel bad for the girl though. Cause in years gone by back in like the peekaboo street days, the fact that we still know the name peekaboo street, and uh, Lindsey Vaughn and all those, like, I feel like she is, you know, the chosen one, but it's all happening during a year that's kind of like, meh, nobody even really gives a fuck. We're talking about the power plants more than we're actually talking about the games. God, I just can't get over the power plants. It is so unbelievable. Although I did see a Photoshop of someone uh, putting, <laughs> like, what, what an American background would look like. And it was, like, basically an exit off of, like, the New Jersey Turnpike where there's like the golden arches and an Exxon mobile and a fucking golden corral with like, you know, just, just highways and big trucks and shit. It's like, yeah, you know, probably don't have the, the finest scenery in America, but we wouldn't host the Olympics there. We would pick some fucking, you know, it would be on an actual mountain. We would be doing some shit in Yellowstone or Montana or wherever the fuck, you know, the real scenery is where you're skiing on an actual mountain. You're telling me that China doesn't have one goddamn snow mountain in that whole fucking area. Can't get over it, man. I also can't get over what is maybe my favorite thing I've ever seen in my life. T.I., the rapper, is now a stand-up comic in what is one of my favorite plot twists of all time. T.I.P., rubber band man, wild as the Taliban, 41 years old now, much younger than I thought. I didn't really, like that. that means T.I. was young when he was first coming out. Uh, back in the early 2000s, he was, you know, like 18, 19, 20 years old. 
um, is now working the Atlanta comedy circuit with in, in all of his TI glory, like all of his slang and his, and his, his, his catchphrases. And he's up there looking like TI you dig, but he's just doing stand up, which I fucking love. I have always said that rappers and comics have so much in common. They're just like one degree of separation away from each other because they're, it's all about wordplay and punchlines and, and, you know, a, a song and a verse is basically a different form of putting together a comedy act. And when you talk about battle raps and shit, like what Roan does and, and some of the greatest rap battles we've ever seen, it's about cracking jokes, making fun of people, wordplay and punchlines and callbacks and all the same shit that you do with a stand-up routine, you do with a rap verse. And I don't know why it feels like T.I. doing it is something special, because if you look at a guy like Lil Dicky, he's always basically been half comic half rapper. You look at Donald Glover, he's a guy who's like, you know, done comedy specials and won Emmys and also is, has some of the, you know, the greatest uh, lyricisms I've ever heard as a rap fan. So it's not like this is unprecedented. You look at a guy like Snoop who's been in movies and is funny. It's, it's right there. There, you know, it's just one little tweak where instead of writing songs, you'd be writing a stand up act. So it, it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me, but the footage of T.I. on stage, it, you know what it is? It's because rap is so cocky and arrogant and comedy is so self-deprecating. That's where there's a huge clash. Everything about the actual words and, and the performance is very, very close. You're on stage. You're comfortable in front of the masses. You know, rap is more about getting oohs and ahs, but at the end of the day, you're also kind of getting laughs. You're not like, it's not like LOL, laugh out loud type shit, but you're laughing because, you know, when, when Drake said, is that a world tour or your girl's tour? It was like, oh, but in reality, that's just a joke. That's just a guy clowning you about, you know, your girlfriend being more popular than you, which is basically stand up comedy. So it's right there. But rappers are programmed to be like, I'm the best. I'm the toughest. I'm the hardest. I'm the flyest. I'm the richest. Everything best, everything better than you. And comedy is all about like exposing yourself and making yourself the butt of the joke. And at least the comedy I like being self-deprecating. So, you know, when you're when you're, for the last 20 years, you've heard a guy saying, I'm the wealthiest. All the girls want to fuck me. I make the most money. I'm the best rapper. And now he's up on stage. His, 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 the main chunk I saw was him talking about how stand-up comedy is much more age appropriate that at the age of 41, he can't be jumping around on stage and, like hooting and hollering. So he wants to just stand there and be calm and tell jokes. And that, you know, he was talking about his song 24s where he's talking about like money, cars, clothes, and hoes. That's all me and my friends know. Shout out Joe Rogan. See how easy it is there just to say a different word, me and my friends. Um, it's, he's like, that's really, that's all I learned. That's all that I knew in my 41 years on this planet. And it's funny. It's just funny to hear a rapper. I, I'm fascinated by, old rappers because it's something that the world has never seen yet before and i've touched upon this before when talking about new rap versus old rap and what what is so intriguing to me about the rap world is that the genre is still so so new when you compare it to other uh other music it's been around you know now we're getting up there but really you know, you talk about like 1979 being like the first time a true real rap record was put out and it doesn't really get cooking until late 80s, 90s. And then, you know, uh, the turn of the, the century and, and, and that's when everything picks up and it becomes this like mainstream, popular, uh, all ages, all races, all sexes, all everything begins to listen to it. And when you really look at the top people in the game, you either we either lost you too early and you were killed like Biggie and Tupac were, or if you were a top top rapper and you have been lucky enough and safe enough to uh, have now aged into your like you know late forties early fifties some of these guys approaching late fifties now you became a, a mega mogul you became a billionaire it's Jay Z it's Puffy it's Dr Dre these guys became it was either like you get murdered or you became a billionaire. I don't know what Snoop's uh, net worth is, but obviously he's another one who's been around longer than anybody. And he's, you know, become a full, full blown household name. Um, 
So it was, you know, for the longest time, these big names as they became, you know, dads and probably soon to be grandfathers, it was like, what are these rappers doing now? Because all we know about them is fucking guns and hoes and drugs and money and flashy and, 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 you know, touring and being this, you know, larger than life cartoon character that you want to be. But now, you know, when Eminem turns fucking 52 and he's still, you know, he's got the weird beard and he's trying to look tough and it's like, well, wait a minute, this is bizarre. And then so seeing a guy like T.I. saying, fuck it, I'm going to go do this entirely new thing that, like I said, is very similar yet very different at the same time. I love it. I want to see all rappers do this. There are some funny fucking guys out there. Can you imagine Busta Rhymes doing Busta Rhymes would be like the, you know, the fucking the loud, bombastic, like prop comic who's selling out arenas doing fucking you know i don't know smashing watermelons or shit gallagher style where you'd have like a tyler the creator just like killing them with like wit and and just dry humor or you know you get some fucking you you get imagine like like the bad boy reunion tour when i went and saw the bad boy reunion tour at msg it was like one of the greatest things of my life mace was falling over puff was out of gas these guys are still trying to be fucking mo money mo problems jiggy in the video and they're old. And if they were just sitting on stage, busting on each other, roasting each other, if Mace was cracking jokes about Puff, I mean, I would love that. It just, just, just to see all your favorite rappers through that different lens is hilarious because it's, again, it's something that we've never seen before. Matt- um, what else do we got here? We're, of course, going to get into your uh, questions. Uh, the Ask Me Anything portion of the show. But I mean, of course, let's let's get into some Joe Rogan. All right, let's get into it. The Joe Rogan portion of the show. I feel like if you're doing any sort of podcasting or talking, you have to talk about Rogan in these in these recent weeks. But um, it is an interesting one. And it's it's one like I said, we touched upon it on KFC radio. Um, and I, I, I obviously still have, you know, I uh, have shared some of those thoughts. But obviously, this is a conversation that can go much deeper than just that. And it's one where. I, I have to remind myself to not get my own, my own self in trouble because it's something, you know, when, when, when George Floyd happened, everybody began chiming in and I realized that's dangerous and stupid and you can come out, you can come out looking, you know, ignorant and, and, uh, and not very sensitive to, you know, the plight of other people. And that was, that was so serious. It was life and death literally. And then, Something like this happens where we're not talking about a murder, but nonetheless is still something where I got to remind myself to, you know, check, check myself at the door because on KFC radio, I was saying, you know, I don't think Joe Rogan is racist and and, and what I've listened to and what I understand about him as a person, I don't think he's racist, but also who fucking cares what I think. That's, that's kind of what I, what I, and a lot of people a lot of white people always need to remind themselves like it doesn't fucking matter what you think because you have you completely lack the understanding to you know declare who is and isn't and uh you know i i can have my opinion about like i i think i have seen joe rogan interact with his friends and other black comics and know how many uh how in comedy you come up in certain neighborhoods and black clubs and traditionally urban areas where, you know, he's the only white guy and he's, he's had so many colleagues and friends over the years who I think would vouch for him and are vouching for him. But that doesn't mean that you can't uh, be racist. Or I think more importantly, it doesn't mean that you can't do racist things. And obviously the video is a big, is, is the huge part of it. And in it, I've said uh, in my one minute man, and I mentioned it on KFC radio, I said it's an out of context video. And a lot of people um, who are, you know, who are on against Rogan, I guess, in this case, um, are saying, what, 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 what do you mean out of context? Uh, what are, you, are you defending the use of that word? And what context is it OK? And that's where things can obviously get dicey. Where I struggle is the idea that context and intent don't matter. I believe that context and intent is all that all that matters in life is context and intent. It is it means everything. It, it it's I mean there there is certain 
contexts and certain circumstances where we allow you to murder somebody. You can kill, no, it's not murder. You can kill somebody and under certain circumstances and in, in certain context and intent, it's allowed. So if that can happen, you can't tell me that context doesn't matter. What you can tell me is that under all context and all intent, it is bad. That I'm okay with. So under no circumstances, is it ever okay? Got it. Totally understand. And that's why I have played by that rule and will never say it. And I, I feel like most people at this point understand. And I really do believe, at least on a from a broadcasting point of view, you're not really going to see this much like ever again um, on a broad scale. Of course, there's always going to be assholes and, and stupid people who push the envelope for the sake of doing it. But uh, I think at this point, everybody kind of understands the rules and that. So if you want to tell me that under any context, with any intent, that is a word that shouldn't be said. And if you do, that's bad. It's wrong. And it's hurtful. Cool. Got it. Understand the rules. But I just still don't believe that we can't, uh, that there isn't some nuance to it. Again, understanding that even at the most nuanced and intellectual level, it's still bad. We're in agreement for that. I still just believe there is a difference than when you are bringing it up in, in conversation about the word. When you're just, like, If you were to tell me that a professor is giving a lecture about the etymology of the word and uses it rather than saying the N-word, that is different than someone in the fucking parking lot of Costco hurling it hatefully at a person. Oh, I saw this video. Oh, man. This video the other day of this kid who gives a sweet chin music super kick right through the fucking window of this guy's car who was calling him the N-word. It was unbelievable. It was the greatest sweet chin music ever, ever delivered. Bob Fox put it up on the, on the site on Barstool. It, I mean, he kicked right through this fucking window because the guy was calling him an N-word, but then was too afraid to get out of his car. It was amazing. That, to me, is very different than if someone is, is delivering a lecture or a conversation about the word. Again, for the 50th time, I am reiterating that I understand all of it is bad, but there is a difference in my mind. And that's where I get caught up, though. It is like, it doesn't matter in your mind, Kevin. In your mind, white dude, it doesn't matter. And, and that's where I, I get myself in trouble, where it's like, a after I did KFC Radio yesterday, I was texting one of my, uh, one of my buddies, is a black guy who I, I hate to... to to say it, but like, he's kind of like my Sherpa for these situations. And I, I lean on him to, to get his perspective and kind of check myself, which is like, you know, it's, it kind of falls under the umbrella of like, I have black friends. It's like, it, it, I don't want to uh, use him in a way, but it's like, I need, I need the perspective to understand. So I did KFC radio and I said, you know, I don't think Joe Rogan's racist. And I asked him and I'm like, do you think he is? He's like, fucking absolutely. He said he, he runs in circles and, and has people on his show that would view me as a lesser person or not even a person. So fuck that and fuck anybody who, you know, gives them a platform. And I was like, damn, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I totally understand that. Now, I, I don't think I think where Joe Rogan got himself in trouble is it's not out of hate, but it's out of uh, it's out of ignorance. It's out of like. You know, just because you think a certain way and you and obviously when a guy like Rogan has gotten so popular, I think Dave ran into this as well. When you get so successful going on your gut and your your playbook and, and your viewpoint of the world and it's worked out. And for the most part, things have been amazing. You made your ton, yourself a ton of money. You've made a ton of other people money. You've saved businesses in Dave's case. Joe Rogan has inspired millions and props up, you know, a ton of people, all that shit, you know, in Joe Rogan's case is like, you know, uh, cultivated entire comedy uh, culture. Like a lot of it can be good. And then you run into the problem of like, in this case, you're wrong. And you followed your gut and you followed your conscience. And in this case, that shit ain't right. And whereas I think Joe Rogan believes I'm just doing an intriguing show. I'm talking to a person. Joe Rogan, I think, would talk to anybody on earth. And that doesn't mean that he co-signs what they say. It doesn't mean that he endorses what they say. I think a lot of times, if you do actually listen to his entire shows uh, or entire conversations, he actually condemns a lot of the fucking assholes that he has on the show. The problem is, it's like, why do you even have them on in the first place? 
that's that's where I think <clears throat> I think a couple of things with Rogan that were like you just can't defend in any way. The Planet of the Apes joke was just a that's just a racist joke. There's just a a old racist trope that you can't like there's no wiggle room. You can't get out of that one. That was just a bad joke. Fucked up. I think the sheer volume of how many times he said it is also problematic. And when you say and they, those videos are out of context, like undeniably the definition of out of context, they are, because it's just him saying the word. You don't hear what's before. You don't hear what's after. The problem is a lot of times, I think uh, the context does show him uh, either condemning the word or simply using it in, in the context of a conversation about the history of it and the, the, the hate behind it and the power of it. But other times, you know, the one where he was kind of like enticing his, his, his uh, guest to say it, it's like, oh yeah, you're just being very flippant about this. And that's where I think he, he's very casual because in, in his mind, he has just done this show and he's always done this show this way. And that's what he set out to do. He, you know, he's not trying to be anything more than that. But as I said on KFC Radio, when you just reach a point where you get so big, it doesn't matter what you want your show to be anymore. It doesn't matter that you want to just say, hey, I, uh, I'm, doing, I'm doing me, man. I'm not, I'm not changing just because I have a ton of viewers. Well, you kind of have to, unfortunately. It sucks. I wish that you could be the same exact guy that was, you know, you and Red Band in the basement because that was the purest, rawest form of podcasting ever, where it was idiots who were just thinking and talking about the world and fucking up and saying dumb things, but saying funny things and saying interesting things and saying wrong things. And that's what the appeal was, was that it was very real and raw. But once you've made it to like, you know, 10 million listeners a day or whatever the fuck it is, hundreds of millions a month, uh, it's, it's just not you can't just play the same old card. It's like being a pro athlete where it's like, I want to, I want to still just be able to go out and do whatever I want and not be bothered. Well, that's just not the game. Unfortunately, you know, if you want the money and, and the influence and the, the opportunities and the success, like this is the other side of it. And so I think Rogan, I think Rogan is guilty of like, I know in my heart what I believe. And so when I say it, I know what I, uh, what I mean and what I don't mean. But it doesn't matter what, what you feel. It matters how they feel. It matters. Why are we not asking <clears throat> that question? It's not about like why you feel like you can say it. Why don't we ask the people uh, who are hurt by it why you can't? And, and that's where I think, uh, and maybe I'm just talking for myself because I just need to constantly remind myself as a person whose uh, job is to give an opinion and especially something like this. It's pot, I mean, podcasting is like my passion and my joy and my work and my career and rogan is considered the godfather of it and i'm so intrigued by the freedom of speech element and the money element and the cultural element and all of that and i want to be in on this conversation and discuss it and but i have to remind myself it doesn't fucking matter and so before i go you know definitively stating what i think about this guy I recognize that the you know the way i was raised and where i was raised and and how i was brought up it's impossible for me to uh, really fully grasp it. And so, you know, I, it's like Rogan, one of the most important things that my buddy said to me was like, Rogan apologized for it. And I do believe that was a sincere apology. I, I think that was a guy who was like, I've, you know, he said, anytime you're, you're, you're making the comments, I'm not racist, you know, you fucked up. But I think it was refreshing to see that it was a guy who I think ultimately knows no matter how the chips may fall on this one, he is okay. He's safe financially. Uh, I think ultimately like his fan base will still ride with him. His family is safe. He's safe. So I think it was a genuine apology where it's like, I'm not fighting for my career. I'm not fighting to be right or wrong. I'm just apologizing for what I saw and now know is fucked up. I've done it myself. The exact same thing happened to me with, with the Kaepernick rundown. When I see myself in that old rundown, I literally go like, Oh fuck. Like that was bad. It was not a funny joke. It was just like, it was way over the top. It was, Oh and when I saw that, I apologized. And I think when you can see the sincerity, uh, I think that does make a difference. But all that being said, <coughs> uh, it, it doesn't matter, you know, if I find it to be sincere or Joe Rogan thinks it's sincere. It matters um, how, you know, the people who are, are hurt by that, what they feel and what they think. So I guess, you know, I'm being very long winded talking all about my opinion, but arriving at the conclusion that it doesn't really matter. But I don't know. This is just how I kind of 
think through these things. And I guess you're kind of just listening to me and a stream of consciousness, try to understand it and learn a little bit more about it and understand why, you know, you can't just, uh, you can't just, uh, I listen to the guy and I think I know what he means. And I think I know where his heart is. So let's not call him a racist. I think there's a lot more, like I said, context and all that shit matters and nuance matters. So it matters in the other direction as well, where, it, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're off the hook just because you were using it in a non-hateful way, or you know what your heart is, or you have black people in your life who love you. It, it just doesn't fucking matter. I think the one thing that I can definitively say that really that really bothers me about Joe Rogan, the sheer number of times he said it to me indicates a guy who thinks like, I can say this because why the fuck not? And that, you know, when you said it 70 times, you get caught, you know, you should never say it. Anything over zero is wrong. But when you're talking about 70, to me, that feels like, all right, man, you, you know where we're at. And, you know, you're just saying, you're saying it, it's gratuitous. It's over the top. That bothers me. And also some of those guests really bothered me. There was a long list of, of Rogan's uh, right wing, quote unquote, right wing guests versus his uh, liberal guests. And that bothered me on one level because, you know, you see a guy like Tim Dillon on there who, if you listen to him and know his comedy, you know that he hates fucking everybody and he's roasted every single side of politics. And a lot of the people that were deemed right wing, it's like, no, they're not right wing. They just maybe one time said something about the vaccine that you don't agree with. So you're deeming them right wing that that bothered me. But there are certain guests that are just undeniable shit bags that I can't believe Rogan gave a platform to. I mean, that that one dude uh, who I actually didn't even really know him until until Feidelberg brought him up, Charles J. Johnson or whatever, who was just like straight up a fucking neo-Nazi and was talking about how black people have a, a gene inside them that make them more more prone to violence. And Rogan, when he has these conversations, if he has a guest on, he's generally not combative. He tries to see all sides of the argument. He definitely stands up for what he believes in. But it's not like I'll have you on to tell you how wrong I think you are. It's more like I'll have you on to, you know, discuss the ins and outs and see where we arrive after a long three hour debate discussion conversation. But again, I just can't believe, you know, in that conversation where he talks about, you know, black people having a gene that makes them more violent uh, in the full clip, Rogan does go on to say like, man, I don't think you know what you're fucking talking about. But why even have that guy on your show? It's, you know, getting on the Joe Rogan show is, is this, it's like the new, you know, getting on Carson where it can make your career. It can, it can turn you into a, a, a huge success. It can make decades of scrapping in comedy clubs or, or uh, you know, trying to make it as an author or a scientist or whatever your field is. It can all overnight flip just because you get the cosign from this one guy. And so I feel like Rogan plays it very like tight to the vest, like who can get on that show and then to choose some of those people who at their, I don't even want to use the word best, but like at the very, the, like the only, only, only thing they could ever provide would be like shock value, true, just shock, jock, racist, hateful, violent bullshit. Some of those people make the cut. That's what really bothers me, especially knowing like, I personally know some comics who I think are like so deserving of getting that Rogan push and, you know, they haven't really gotten political or, or dove into the vaccine or Fauci and all that shit that Rogan has really been pushing. And so they don't get a shot, but you know, some fucking somebody, even with like a loose affiliation to the proud boys or neo-Nazis, they get the nod. That's bullshit. That sucks. And I, I, I feel like it's naive for, of me to say like, I don't, I, I don't think Rogan is, is motivated by numbers and downloads because he does so many of them. And it does seem like he's more just about good, intriguing conversation, but you got to believe that he looks at when I have, when I talk about, you know, vaccines and Fauci and shit, business is good. There's some level that has to happen. And so, you know, I don't even know what's worse. What's worse having some of those guys on because you think that they're intriguing conversation or having those guys on because you think they do good numbers and either scenario, it's just fucking garbage that I hate, you know, the Alex Joneses of the world. Like the fact that Alex Jones is probably one of the better, like more scrupulous guys is sick. You know, that's sickening. That's the one thing that I, I don't think uh, Rogan, you know, 
at the end of the day, it's his show. Like I said, I think he wants to just do his show. He'll talk to anybody on the planet Earth because I think he has a great thirst for knowledge and debate and discussion. But I guess when, like I said, once you reach a certain level, you have to understand that it's not just about who you think is interesting. Even if you're, even if you're, uh, you know, disagreeing with them, even if you're putting them down, even if you're, you know, it's like, I, I feel it bothers me that he went harder at uh, Sanjay Gupta from CNN. Now, granted, in that case, he was being personally attacked and they were lying about him. So I understand the need to be uh, aggressive and defend himself. But like he went harder at that guy than he does some of these like out, out of the closet, blatant fucking racists that, that I can't get down with. So at the end of the day, here's really what I think it is. Anybody who, who stands any podcast is you're either going to end up in arguments and debates and discussions you really don't want to be in, or you just, you need to check yourself because nobody on the internet should sway you as much as some of these people seem to be swayed one direction or the other. Whether you're talking about a podcaster, a comic, a, uh, a, a philosopher of sorts, a, uh, a, a talking head on, on TV, whether it's Fox or CNN or Owens or Shapiro or Rogan or who, you know, whoever. If you, if you consume internet content with anything other than I'm here, you know, I'm, they're here for me to laugh at them. Uh, they're here for me to, you know, learn some interesting shit. But at the end of the day, you make your own fucking decisions. Anybody who is like blanket agreeing with or blindly defending either side of it from anything you hear on the Internet, you're a fucking child. Like use your own goddamn brain and realize at the end of the day, all of these people are either entertainers or or uh, or people who are just looking for a following and money and scratching that itch of fame and power and, and clout. That, I mean, that's all it is. And especially, I mean, the, the thing that drives me crazy is the, the world of stand-up comedy right now. And we talked about this as well. And, and Feidelberg hit the nail on the head. The other thing that Rogan is guilty of is creating this high horse, holier than thou, air about the, the the comics of the world that they are the new modern day philosophers who are uh you know pushing the boundaries of of human thought and shit it's like come on guys i love stand-up comedy i love the, the world of podcasting i think that there is more to it than simply laughs i think that you can learn a lot about yourself and uh we you can have discussions and conversations through the lens of comedy that can be enlightening and all that shit. But to act like you're more than just here to provide entertainment and let people, like it's already noble. It's already a good enough thing to say, I'm here to provide some laughs so that you can get through your shitty life. That's already good. That is already a, a worthwhile cause. The world needs that. So why do you need to become this you know, modern day fucking Socrates up there. You're not, none of you are. And, and watching the whole comedy world, they all learned this, how, how it works with Rogan, whether, whether it's right, whether you're right or wrong, whether you believe R Rogan is a outward racist or not, whether you think context in or out of context, all the shit we just discussed, no matter what side you fall on, you have to acknowledge this is a coordinated attack to try to bring someone down and watching the world learn that where they're like, Hey, wait a minute. Uh, you know, I thought this was about COVID. Oh, no, wait, now it's about transphobia. And now, now it's about misogyny. Oh, no, no, it's about racism. And it was this video, and now it's that video. And I thought we were talking about misinformation about the vaccine, but why are we not talking about the Planet of the Apes joke? It's because this is all a coordinated attack that comes in waves. And we've been dealing with it at Barstool forever. And I say we, it's mostly Dave. Uh, it's happened to me on a much lesser level. It happens to us on the whole as a company. A lot of the women have to go through it because they are regarded as token hires. Uh, but it's mostly Dave that has taken that on the chin, whether it was the misogyny charges or uh, or now these made up sexual assault uh, uh, allegations. It's it's this playbook that we've been going through forever. And now watching the rest of the world kind of catch up to it is funny because it's like, oh, yeah, guys, this is this is how it's always been. We were dealing with this when it before it was like even weaponized on social media when it was like you know p 
pe- women with fucking bullhorns in, you know, uh, like uh, out in a fucking park in Boston, you know, when it was like physical, you know, flyers that people were putting up on campuses and shit like that. This has been going on forever. And I think it gets, it just gets very dangerous when people think that they are more important than they are, or the first people to go through something, you know, we watched it with the pandemic too. Every comic thought that using the internet during the pandemic was some sort of revolutionary idea for their comedy. And I'm super thrilled that everybody got on board with YouTube and video podcasts and short form uh, commentary and all sorts of shit that we've been doing at Barcelona Sports forever. Because I think the internet became a funnier place once everybody got on board with it. But the idea that these comics were the first to do it and are now the, you know, the only people to have been canceled or attacked. It's like, guys, come on. You, you cannot be the center of absolutely everything. That, that is, that's a, uh, that's a tough one to watch. The, the latest one I saw, uh, Schultz, Andrew Schultz was talking about how he believes that China is taking down America by making the algorithm for TikTok reward dancing and lip syncing so that this generation of American kids aren't doing math and science. They're out here singing and dancing. That it's not that the algorithm, it's not that the dancing and the and lip syncing is what the people enjoy. And that's what the algorithm is rewarding. It's the other way around because it's a weapon that China is now using to take out this generation of Americans. And the amount of people who were like, wow, like mind blown. It's like, no, man, TikTok was doing this back when it was musically because teenage girls like to sing and dance and they always have and they always fucking will. And there's something about dancing and singing and entertaining that people enjoy. And that's what gets picked up. And that's what the algorithm rewards. Not that over in on Weibo, the algorithm rewards, you know, engineering equations that, you know, they're going to be smart because their social media is geared towards that. It's, it's not that deep. It's not that important. You're not that revolutionary. It's not, it's not, it's just not. We're all just looking for followers and clicks and selling tickets and selling merch and making people laugh and being called the funniest. That's what we're here to do. And I say we, not meaning that I'm a stand-up comic and not meaning that they are, you know, bloggers and writers. Everybody has their specialties and things that they do. But man, are we smelling our own fucking farts in this, uh, you know, influencer internet industry here. Everybody's got their own head up, their own ass, other asses. How many heads, how many assholes can we put our heads up? I'll put it up my own. I'll put it up Rogan's. I'll put it up his. I'll put it up hers. I mean, it is just crazy. So like if we could for the love of god get back to what the internet used to be wouldn't that be fucking nice and the internet was just about let's get back to the ti ti is the hero we need ti is not going to get on stage and talk about you know revolutionizing the the world he's just like i'm going to try to crack jokes because i used to write rhymes about you know fat asses and drugs and guns and now i wanted to talk about you know being a washed up rapper with a family and and how that's funny That's what we need. T.I. is going to save the fucking world as we know it. T.I. has the chance to save the world. You know who else does? You know who else we need more of? We need more of guys like Bruce Willis. Take a guess how many movies Bruce Willis did in the year of our Lord, 2021. This last year, Bruce Willis. Sixth Sense, Armageddon, John McClane, Die Hard. One of the all-time iconic action heroes at the age of let's see let me just get the exact um stats for you bruce willis age he is 66 so in his season 65 years of age how many movies do you think he did because i would have guessed none maybe one bruce willis did eight movies last year that dude has never turned down a paycheck. He has his unprecedented, his own category in the Razzies. The Razzies are the opposite of the Oscars. They give out awards for the worst movies and the worst performances of the year. Bruce Willis has his own category because he's made eight movies and all of them suck. I mean, I couldn't even name, I don't think I could name one of them. Bruce Willis 
in 2021. Let's pull up his IMDb. I, I, I mean, gun to my head, I don't know if I would be able to tell you one of the movies he did in, in, this, in this most recent year. Holy shit. Okay, ready? 2021. Cosmic Sin, Midnight in the Switchgrass, Out of Death, Survive the Game, Apex, Deadlock, Fortress, and American Siege. In 2022... In 2022, these are all in post-production. Gasoline Alley, Vendetta, Fortress, Sniper's Eye, A Day to Die, The Wrong Place, Die Like Lovers, Corrective Measures, White Elephant, Paradise City, Wire Room, Fortress 3. I don't even know what Fortress is. There's three of them in the last two years. And he's got something that's already scheduled for 2023. In the year, in, in just, from just 2020 till now, He's done 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I'm doing my Francesa right now. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. From 2020 to 2023, he did 25 movies. 25. That is astounding. This dude has never turned down a movie. In the year 2007, he did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He did seven in 2007. He did like six or seven in 2006. This is, his, this is just how he does it. I, I would have never guessed that. I saw Ken Jack tweeted, Bruce Willis is what everyone thinks Nicolas Cage does. Like Nicolas Cage has never turned down a movie. Bruce Willis has literally never turned down a movie. And I don't know if that's just because he likes being on set. I don't know if that's because he's got bills to pay. I don't know if he's got a habit he's got to pay off. If he's being blackmailed and needs cash or if he just says, fuck it, I want to amass as much money as I possibly can while I'm still on this planet Earth and I'm a bald guy, so it doesn't even matter how I look. I mean, Bruce Willis has looked the exact same way for the last 25 years, so you might as well just keep doing these movies. That's amazing. And in a world where I firmly believe that less is more, and as we get in, as we are now fully entrenched in the social media era where it's like you learn everything about everybody and you see there's no more behind the scenes. Everything is included. Everything is a reality show. I believe that the people who keep it a little mysterious are the ones who really like captivate and, and, and like enrapture us. But also fuck that. Also completely fuck that. If you're going to go the other direction, go all the way like Bruce Willis where you don't take yourself seriously. You're not like, like Bruce Willis is the antithesis of every comedian out right now. Like, let me pull up. I love her to death, but Whitney Cummings had that quote about Rogan on her Twitter that was so far fetched and, and, and so, uh, uh, so like sanctimonious and over the top where she was talking about like what comedians are, are supposed to do and what role they're supposed to play. Um, she said this was in response to, to Rogan getting canceled, where like I think she she was she meant this to be like a defense of her friend, where I think all she could have, you know, she could have just spoken about Joe Rogan, but instead said. Um, where is it? Comedians did not sign up to be your hero. It's our job to be irreverent and dangerous. And right there, she could have just said and to make you laugh and it would have been fine. But she said, it's our job to question authority and take you through a spooky, mental, haunted house so you can arrive at your own conclusions. Stay focused on the people we pay taxes to to be moral leaders. That I'm okay with. The idea of, you know, you're not here to be a moral leader, I'm cool with. But this, you're also not my Sherpa to guide me through the mental uh, haunted house to arrive at, you know, my, my new foundings. You're supposed to make me fucking laugh. Uh, and Bruce Willis is not out here talking about, you know, the, the depths of the craft of acting and he's not trying to win war awards and he's not trying to preach about politics and be something he's not. He's just like, yeah, I'll fucking be the guy with the gun again for the hundredth time this year. That's what we fucking need because at the end of the day, everybody is just a mindless dope. If you think you're smart, you're not. If you think you're intellectual, you're not. If you're doing any of this shit, if you're arguing on Twitter, if you follow these accounts, if you, you're, you're, you're not as special as you think you are.
because the real smart people are the ones that could recognize how fucking toxic and stupid and pointless the internet actually is. If you're on all these apps, you're a fucking moron, myself included. You're an idiot. You're not, you're not an intellectual. You're not changing the world. You're like the fucking morons on the Tinder swindler. Have you watched this? This is one of the greatest documentaries Netflix has ever put out for basically all the wrong reasons. It's a, it's a two hour documentary with, a, with an intriguing situation. It's about a, a, uh, a, a guy on Tinder who just has multiple girlfriends and he, he uh, defrauds all of them into paying his bills. Uh, but it really just highlighted how fucking stupid everyone in this world can be. The Tinder swindler is like, you want to you get a good cross-section? You want to get a good look at, at the, the, the human brain right now? Watch the fucking Tinder swindler. Because as much of a scumbag as that guy was, his name was Simon, or that's at least his fake name, he recognized how fucking dumb people can be and just played them for their money. And it's the same thing that Donald Trump did with the election and what, uh, what uh, you know, fucking uh, uh, QAnon can do with their message boards. It's like, if you recognize, if you, can, if you harness how dumb the world is, you can get away with murder. You can get away with almost anything. The Tinder swindler, the girls that were falling for this guy's game, it blew my fucking mind. And if you are a guy out here on Tinder who can't get a girl to fuck you or to hook up with you or to go out with you, you should feel badly about yourself. Because if you watch the Tinder swindler, you can realize just how fucking dumb seemingly put together adult women really are. And you can't even get them to, to, to text back when this guy, Simon, has these chicks signing up for like 10 different credit cards to send him like $200,000 all because he like took them out for coffee and remembered their birthday. You got, it's, it's hard to explain if you haven't watched it, but basically this guy said that he was the, the heir to the diamond throne that the, uh, I can't remember the name of this Israeli family that like runs the entire diamond market. He was the son, he was the heir and he takes him out for this, you know, lavish first date at the Four Seasons. But the amount of and, and then and then over the time over the course of time explains that he has enemies who are out to get him. So he can't use his own credit cards. So I need you to sign up for credit cards and send me money. And the shit that these women did just blowing through the reddest of flags, things that are like anybody with a shred of a brain would be like, ah, this is kind of weird. I don't think I want to date this guy, let alone compromise my entire financial existence for him it was fucking insane dude had these chicks what kind of girls can just pull up and drop like a hundred and forty thousand dollars cash just get out a few loans and drop you know six figures in a loan for their man i'm dating the wrong chicks i'm still out here paying for dinner like a fucking sucker what I need is some of these chicks who could just, well, you know, hey, can you open up your ninth credit card and send me, you know, 200K because my enemies are about to get me? It was actually, Simon is, a, is a, an absolute scumbag piece of shit, but kind of like the guy, like, snake it to you, make it. Like, hats off that you can, if you can pull the, those kind of stunts, I'm impressed. It, he's the, he's like, it's like uh, in catch me if you can, when Tom Hanks wants DiCaprio to come work for the government, because he's so good at being a criminal, just use your powers for, for good instead of evil. That dude, if he put half of the effort he did into scamming chicks into a legitimate business, he'd be a millionaire anyway. I don't even know how he pulled half of it off. Cause at, I understand where he was scamming people where he would just pay one person, like pay for his bills with one chick with another chick's credit cards. And it was just like a Ponzi scheme. But initially there has to be still has to be a private jet and a Rolls Royce. And he's got to convince the woman to be, to pretend to be his baby mama. And like all of this shit that on some level he did, he did provide these girls with like, yeah, look, I'm wealthy. And I travel the world and I throw these parties. And like, if I, if I wanted to go defraud you, I couldn't even do step one. 
So somewhere along the way, he has these connections or had enough money to have a baseline of fancy clothes and fancy cars. And like, that's pretty fucking good. You're an absolute fucking sociopath scumbag with the weirdest of desires. Like having to juggle that many girls, I, I can't even... I can't even begin to understand how you do it or why you would want to do it. But again, the, the, the brain capacity it takes to juggle those women and, and to scam the money and to keep it all moving and keep it all like he's, he's, he's free right now. He's not even in jail. This guy, if you watch it, they have his face, they have his name. They know who he is. They have multiple accounts from multiple women about him stealing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. And he's still out there dating chicks and fuck it. I mean, that is insane. The fact that the Tinder swindler seemingly at the end of the movie, they were like, it appears that Simon doesn't have any more financial troubles. The fact that that guy is doing well financially and romantically, I'm telling you, there are people watching the Tinder swindler and absolutely going to go jump off a bridge right now. There are good people, smart people who are in the fucking dumps, who can't get their dick wet, who can't get laid and they can't make a fucking dollar. And Simon is out here, a full-blown admitted and caught criminal who is living free, fucking, and apparently making a ton of money. And at some point, yeah, you're a bag of shit, dude. But at some point, when do you tip your cap? At some point, don't you got to just say like, you know, the proof's in the pudding. It's truly catch me if you can. And they can't. They can't seem to stop him. He did like a quick bid in prison and that was it. Otherwise, he's just got these like hot blonde chicks from fucking hot, dumb blonde chicks from like Norway who are just giving him money and banging him. You know, <laughs> he's, he's playing by the rules or he's, he's not playing by the rules at all. He's playing by the, the rules of life, though. It's like you are what you can make of yourself. And apparently, if you find the, the biggest suckers in the world. You can live life to the fucking most lavish extent. It's crazy. I don't know who would want to do it because it's, it's the most stressful. And again, if you just had a regular job, it would probably be easier. But, you know, you got some weird sociopathic itch you need to scratch. But God damn, you know, there are people out there who are trying every which way to find the one and to, and to succeed in your career. And Simon can just... You just make that shit happen. It's it's honestly it's sort of similar to the way that the 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 people who are taking down Dave and taking down Rogan, uh, those Midas Touch brothers who Dave uh, argued with on the internet. If you saw it, Dave. Long story short, the uh, the same people who are trying to like systematically take down Rogan. Uh, it was the same playbook that that they did for Dave. So Dave started looking at these two Twitter accounts, and what they had in common were these three brothers who created this social media presence that their main objective was try to uh, take back the White House in the 2020 election and keep Trump out. And they're scumbags and they are weasels, but you have to tip your cap to the way that the, some of these people have learned how to use the internet and how to uh, manipulate and get results. And I hate that people are, that, that, that they use it in like the slimiest and scummiest of ways, but if, if you want, like, again, there are, so, there are so many people out there who, who try to go viral and want to be recognized and want their break. And in reality, if you study up and you learn the right ways to do it and you pull the right levers and make just a couple connections, you can fabricate that shit every fucking time. I don't want to. It, it's, it's like, I don't know if I could. I don't know if I'm savvy enough, but I'm sure if you put enough research into it and learn it enough, and learn how to, uh, to, you know, manipulate social media, you could do it. I, I don't care to do it, but I, it's just scary, I guess, that like technically anybody can do it. If you look at, if you follow this account, Wokal Distance at W-O-K-A-L underscore distance. He is kind of an anti-cancel culture crusade guy. He was the one who outed these three brothers as being uh, the same guys who attack Rogan as attack Dave. And he lays out systematically how you can manipulate social media to get whatever you want done politically. And it's just wild to me. It's like, you know, very tangible stuff. Like they, you, you set up this account, this account puts out the video, 
you retweet it from these accounts while never actually endorsing it. But if you mass retweet it enough, it begins to affect the algorithm. Once the algorithm reaches saturation, now the message is out there. And next thing you know, you are impacting elections and you are impacting careers and you are trying to take down uh, shows. And it's like the same thing as the Tinder swindler, man. If you know how to prey upon people with the tools you have at your disposal today, ain't nothing you can't do. It is fucking terrifying to think that. I mean, there's just enough dumb people. There's enough dumb people. And there's uh, enough smart people who know how to manipulate the dumb masses that like we're going down a dark, dark fucking road. Or I just wish the Internet was back to dick jokes and Internet porn and funny videos of people getting hit in the fucking face, hitting the dick like R.I.P. Bob Saget, man. Once Bob died and we left the America's Funniest Home Videos era behind and now it's just officially manipulation and fucking I don't even know what man it's disheartening to be to be a part of the internet sometimes where it's just like well I don't know maybe maybe we just got to keep on fighting the good fight where it's like if you hate all this other shit and if you don't want to be a part of all that it's almost like the the, the, the 1995 source awards Shug Knight if you want a producer all up in the videos all up on the record come to death row It's sort of like if you don't want to do these fucking debates, talk about politics and cancel culture and freedom of speech and all that shit, come to KFC Radio where we're talking about chickens and fucking getting laid and and, and dumb shit and pop culture and, and movies and TV and all that shit back. Like, come on over where we're a safe haven where you still just want to be entertained and not have to worry about everything being politicized and everything being manipulated and everything being the fucking worst. It's like, just admit you what you are, admit what you aren't and come laugh with us. We're just here to fuck around.